Last year, the hashtag Oscar So White protested the lack of black actors and actresses at the Academy Awards for a second year in a row. This year has some saying that maybe we don't need the hashtag anymore, as the Oscars have nominated a more inclusive class. And two of the movies nominated for Best Picture revolve around the black male experience and what it means to be a black man. Joining us to talk about this, Cameron Bailey, Artistic Director, TIFF. Maurice Tomlinson, Senior Policy Analyst with the Canadian HIV AIDS Legal Network. Mark Campbell, Adjunct Professor at Ryerson University. Wesley Critchlow, Associate Professor in the Faculty of Social Sciences and Humanities at the University of Ontario Institute of Technology. And actor, Jonathan Nathaniel. Welcome. Thanks. Thank you Thanks all for me. being here to talk about this. Cameron, I wanted to start with you. The Oscars have finally made themselves somewhat more inclusive. And we should say that Oscar So White was started by activist April Rain. Um, and two Oscar Best Picture nominees tell stories about black men. Can you tell us about Moonlight? Moonlight is a beautiful story of a man discovering his sexual identity. He's played by three different actors at three stages of the man's uh, life as a, a boy, first of all, where he's uh, bullied, as a teenager where it gets worse, uh, but he discovers his, a kind of burgeoning uh, sexuality and his attraction to other men. And then finally, as a grown man where he has a full identity, um, but it is, it's in secret, it's compromised by homophobia all around him. Um, and it's directed by Barry Jenkins. And can you tell us about Fences? Uh, Fences is based on the August Wilson play. This is the story that's set in the 1950s in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The story of a man who works uh, on a garbage truck in, uh, in Pittsburgh, but he had a, uh, a career that he was dreaming about as a baseball player. That never worked out because of the racist uh, sports uh, leagues at the time. Um, and uh, he dominates his family. His wife, uh, he's played by Denzel Washington. His wife is played by Vi Viola Davis and uh, his uh, sons as well. Um, terrific play has been done all around the world and Denzel Washington and Viola Davis played this on Broadway and now they've brought it to film. Uh, Maurice, I want to bring you into this. Um, what, do you, what do these movies say about black men that we haven't heard before? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I wish there was something unique that they would bring to the experience. I think it's just important, as Viola said, that we are, for example, in Fences, talking about the average black male experiences, not the extraordinary, not the um, unique, just this is what it means to be a average black man, mm -hmm. because we portray average white men very often in movies. Mm -hmm. But it's always something unique about a black man that brings the, uh, you know, a movie or a script and to what, the person. In the past, what have we seen as far as it being unique? Well, I mean, I, I, I like Moonlight, for example, mm -hmm. but it, there is an issue around his homophobia and um, his, the homosexuality. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the images that I have seen of black men have always been, well, you have to be exceptional for Hollywood to take notice of you. I, I think that Fences breaks that stereotype, mm -hmm. and I think that's wonderful. <gasps> and Wesley, what do you think? Uh, I, I saw Moonlight. Um, I really liked it because I think what it did was put out a narrative for people who are coming to terms with their sexual orientation and their identity as black, gay, young black youth, to, to look up to something that represents their everyday struggles, their everyday narratives. And I think that the, the beauty of it was that three different actors represented different stages in a man's, black man's life, which was really well done. And I think um, in that sense, it, it captured the struggles of everyday uh, homophobia within the black community. And, but it also showed you how hypermasculinity in particular can be used as a facade that not only represents heterosexism, but represents hypermasculinity in the context of being gay and lesbian, et cetera. Because as we see Chiron growing up, he does possess, he becomes this, very he embodies this very yeah. hypermasculine. And Mark, what do you think? Um, well, I, th what I liked, I liked the range that we were able to see in Moonlight, right? We saw, of all the characters, we saw a range of black masculinities, and I, I thought that was humanizing, mm -hmm. in that we can see the stereotype that we're, we often see of the drug dealer, but we can also see a humanized side of him. We can, we can see um, a young boy moving through his life and coming to terms with, with his identity and growing his identity, actually being an, an agent, being act, active in taking information in and trying to shape who he's going to be, whether that's protecting his, his desires and his actual orientation or protecting his body, but there's a, a way in which we can read black masculinity in a much wider range or scope in that one film. Jonathan? 
Uh, I loved both films. Uh, I loved Moonlight, I loved Fences. Um, I watched them both last night for the first time. I waited a while to, to screen them, and there, was, there wasn't a sense of urgency, and I, and I was talking to Mark about it earlier. Um, for me, it, it, it almost seemed too soon or, or too close to home. Mm. Um, it, it, Which one, Fences or Moonlight? Both. Both. Oh. both. Um, you know, they, they should have a trigger warning for, for <laughs> if you're a black male, because it, it is our story, and um, because we've lived it, it's, yeah. it's, we're not rushing to see it again yeah. on TV because it is so traumatic. Yeah. Um, and does reopen wounds that you've just begun to heal. Yeah. Um, but they were beautifully done, and I'm so glad I saw them. Because the buzz is you, you can't go anywhere without hearing about Moonlight or uh, Fences. And the performances <laughs> are amazing by um, all of the actors in the films. Um, I'm grateful that these films are now um, having wide theatrical releases and people are getting, are getting a chance to see them that wouldn't have a chance to see them or, or wouldn't want to see them because mm -hmm. um, it doesn't really affect their circle um, because it does create that conversation and then that dialogue that's been needed to be said, I think, mm -hmm. for a very long time. Cameron, so. why do you think these movies got so much attention this year? Um, it took a while for them to get so much attention. I remember we showed Moonlight at the Toronto Film Festival um, and uh, there were some people who knew Barry Jenkins's work and were excited to see the film, but a lot of people didn't know about it at all. Uh, and then we were able to have the, the film in, in our Lightbox uh, cinema from about November and it was a slow burn. Initially, there were some people who found out about it through their own channels. They follow movies, they're cinephiles. Um, but for a long time, you'd ask people, do you know about this movie Moonlight? You gotta see Moonlight. And they'd be like, uh, what's Moonlight? Mm -hmm. Now everybody knows about Moonlight. Mm -hmm. Of course, it, it has been picking up awards uh, in North America and all over the world. And I think the thing about, um, you know, it's too close to home, I think that's part of it as well. Certainly among the black community, some people felt like, I don't need to see Moonlight, mm -hmm. I don't need to see Fences, I live this world. Mm -hmm. And that to me speaks to a very important point, which is what you were saying earlier, we don't see our ordinary lives on screen very often. We're used to the lives of ordinary people being white people because mm -hmm. Hollywood gives us that. Fact is one out of every eight people in America is an African-American, mm -hmm. but do, is one out of every eight movies about an African-American mm -hmm. as an ordinary person? Mm -hmm. Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. When I was studying in school, I studied Arthur Miller's Death of a Salesman over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. The American Everyman, mm -hmm. right? But the character that Denzel Washington plays in Fences is also the American mm -hmm. Everyman. And it, it's taken us a while to come around to that, to see these stories as ordinary stories. Well, Trevante Rhodes, who plays the adult version of Chiron, um, said this. Growing up, you're told that being a black man, you have to be that much better than your counterparts. You have to be stronger, more masculine, and the most dominant force in the room at all times. Mm -hmm. So that automatically puts, you, puts up that block, and you don't think it's possible to have any kind of vulnerability about you. Did anyone else feel that growing up, oh, Wesley? Yeah. Oh, yeah, as a black gay man <laughs> growing up in Trinidad, hypermasculinity as performance mm -hmm. is, is a necessary tool for survival. And hypermasculinity as performance, not only is it survival, it just erases any form of policing and question of your sexual orientation from others, in particular uh, within the context of religious communities mm -hmm. and among your peers. Uh, you are expected to have many girlfriends as a young black man growing up in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. So if you were not doing that, um, then a performance can erase any questions of tenderness of ephemophobia. Mm -hmm. So I, I think he's, he's right when he says that uh, it had to be tough in order to survive. Maurice, let's go around the table. Yes, I, I would certainly agree. I mean, coming from the Caribbean myself, I'm from Jamaica, mm -hmm. and there was an expectation that in our patriarchal society, men don't show emotion. And as I shared earlier um, with someone, I cannot cry now, mm -hmm. and it's very debilitating for me. No matter how devastating the situation is, I cannot cry at all. At all, and uh, you know, I, I force myself. I try to. I. Tr it's very sad because I have a 16-year-old son mm -hmm. who I hope is able to show emotion because it's so important. It's very cleansing. So what, what do you do then when you feel that need to cry? Like, how do you express that pain? I mean, I get very depressed, but I can't cry. Mm -hmm. And you feel the burning. I feel the need to express it, but I just can't. Parents um, who are ill, family members who die, I can't express it in the way that you know, I hate to say this, women can, <laughs> but mm -hmm. I just can't. Because as a black man, you're not supposed <clears throat> to I'm not that. expected to cry. And the, uh, as, as Wesley pointed out, the performance, the need to be macho or tough has impacted my life uh, professionally as well. Mm -hmm. I used to be a flight attendant 
And as everybody knows, 75% of flight attendants are gay. <laughs> <laughs> Does everybody know that? <laughs> <laughs> but my boss at the time told me that I needed to stand in front of a mirror, try to deepen my voice, and act more macho. Yeah. Because passengers were complaining that I looked too gay. So I must know, have hurt? Yes, I know I have to police my walk mm -hmm. and try and toughen up when I'm in that you know, that space, as a result, I don't know what my real gate is. I don't know what the real Maurice is. Mm -hmm. Because you've been edited so much. I've been edited, I've been policing myself so much. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's very debilitating, very, very debilitating. Oh, Jonathan, you, were, you grew up in the GTA, mm -hmm. in Greater Toronto area. Yeah. Um, do you agree? Do you disagree? What was your experience like? Uh, I was lucky um, to have been raised by a village of women. Uh, my two grandmothers uh, raised me uh, as an only child in the, in the household, and my mother and my aunts were all a part of the family. My father um, was in my fam in my life and supported me, but wasn't in the household, um, so I didn't have that pressure to um, be hyper masculine or to or to um, uh, perform mm -hmm. um, a certain role to get by. Um, so do you think that comes from the father, as a, not the mother, not the? I think it comes from the lack of having a, 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 um, a father figure in my mm -hmm. life, um, that his, um, I guess, pressures weren't passed down onto me. So I was um, nurtured and, and uh, caring was, it was important in our household and empathy and compassion and you know, expressing yourself creatively, that was more encouraged because I, I was raised by women. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I was able to um, get into the arts at a really young age and not have to modify my behavior, personality, um, within my family. When, once I got into junior high and, high, and uh, even elementary school and junior high, it was, it was where I had to sort of put on that facade. That, uh, that so where did the, those expectations come from then? From your classmates? From I think, yeah, yeah, my classmates and I guess their families and the, and the culture and their fathers as well. Mm -hmm. Um, can, can I just uh, say, I think there's maybe something worth underlining here, which is that um, for all of us, I think we are aware that masculinity is a performance. Yeah, I think, yeah. and femininity also is a performance. Yeah. And I think most people understand that if they're aware of what they put on before they go out the door mm -hmm. and how they talk to people. Um, but pop culture has a big part to play here. Um, most of us are surrounded by hypermasculine images of black men, which come from uh, sports media, which come from music uh, media, which come from the, the, the images and the tropes that, that are broadcast at us. And so when we go out into the world, we are in a way uh, either speaking through or speaking against those images mm -hmm. that are already out there, the, the hypermasculine rapper, the hypermasculine football player, the hypermasculine um, athlete. Uh, you know, this, even in movies, you often see, I mean, Denzel Washington won his Academy Award for Training Day, right? Mm -hmm. like another hyper-masculine black male. Where he so, was playing like a rogue cop. Exactly, yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, you know, both Fences and especially Moonlight are giving us images that are counter to mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. But we live with that every day. And I think that, that's worth, um, yeah. worth pointing mm -hmm. out, I think. Mark? I should also add to that is that we get rewarded in our society for performing a, mm -hmm. a type of masculinity that people can relate to from the movies, from mm -hmm. uh, yeah. sports, from music videos. You get rewarded in the public sphere for those kinds of performances. So do, other... movies, do movies like Fences and Moonlight um, help to combat those stereotypes? Um, mm -hmm. No. Not, not yet, not yet. No, I think, I think, yeah. I think we're about 40 or 50 <laughs> years of yeah. media away yeah. from, from there being some sort of public realm where there's a, 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 a wider range mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. which performances of masculinity yeah. will be allowed. And the reason why I say that is that the people that reward us is, you know, not just our, our coaches on teams, right? If you played a sport, but if you're uh, courting a mate, right? man or woman, that person has certain ideologies of how mm -hmm. your masculinity should be performed. And if you don't perform to their liking, right, then you're at, without a partner. So th there's, a, there's a bunch of ways, like in, in, even uh, in, your, in your profession, mm -hmm. right? Like mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a professor and I'm trained as a high school teacher. There's certain ways in which classroom management and all of these kinds of things yeah. are expected to be performed yes. by a heterosexual male and you'll be rewarded for yes. performing them in a particular kind of way. Leslie? No, and also, I mean, taking up on this point is that I, I, I think also, too, we also have to look at the sexualization of racism as a reward. 
In what terms does that of, mean? Oh, the stereotypes embedded within black masculinity as where black men in particular are a penis and nothing else. Mm -hmm. So the, the tropes of black masculinity in terms of one of the rewards also is how, um, how some black men who have not come to terms with emotions and, and, and come to terms with a uh, set, set in boundaries between uh, themselves and how you treat people, this desexualization trope can sometimes become a reward for some who misunderstand it. Mm -hmm. So there are ways in which um, uh, my students sometimes will tell me I'm, I'm not gay, you know, no matter how much I say that to them. Mm -hmm. So, and, and it's because, you just remember, you, you see what you want to see. Mm -hmm. So that's, that gaze, we never can stop that gaze of what the black body looks like when you see it. So the sexualization of racism plays a major role in, in terms of how our performance of hypermasculinity gets played out and also gets taken up and consumed, in particular by white culture. Maurice? Um, so I come from a small society, and I think that, well, research has proven that in smaller societies, change can happen quicker through contact. Um, and I certainly think these kinds of movies will help to disrupt the narrative that men can only be a certain way mm -hmm. because the major cultural agent right now is evangelical church in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. And they get to spew their message of this is what society should look like every, you know, every weekend. But unless we try to de deliberately disrupt it through the media, through um, you know, screenings of these kinds of films, we will be stuck where we are. And I think mm -hmm. one of the examples I use is in the United States, Will and Grace, the new normal, you know, those kinds of images help to um, normalize, mm -hmm. I hate to use those terms, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. white gayness. White gayness. White gayness. But the point is, um, the hostility towards LGBT people um, was lessened because of the, the power of, of the, those, those images. I think that we need more of those images and that is one of the reasons, for example, we, there's a film I'm in called The Abominable Crime. We deliberately take it around the island to small pockets, mm -hmm. you know, to have conversations. Where do you conversation... do it in public, though, or do you yes. do it very quietly? Yes, oh, yes, really? yes, yes. We do have the screenings in public. They don't know what this film is about. It's just mm -hmm. called The Abominable Crime. It could be anything. Mm -hmm. um, and we do it deliberately to have conversations because the film will not be aired on national television. It's just banned from <laughs> being aired on Would national... a movie like Moonlight be screened in Jamaica? No, that's a good question. Because when Brokeback Mountain aired in Jamaica, it was it caused quite a bit of consternation. Mm -hmm. um, it was aired at the national um, cinema, but then I think the evangelicals got riled up, and I, I don't know. I'm really curious to see how mm -hmm. Moonlight will play. And Cameron, what do you think? Do you think like movies like Fences and Moonlight creating dialogue, do you think that they could be used to combat stereotypes? Absolutely. I think art can do that at its mm -hmm. best, and the, there's superb writing, direction, and uh, performances in, in both of these movies. I think if you watch a character like Chiron, mm -hmm. particularly when he's played by the, the, the last um, actor, uh, Trevante Rose, as an mm -hmm. adult, and you see him, and he's got ripped abs, and he's very muscular, and he's got the fronts, and he's mm -hmm. got this kind of a very kind of uh, quote unquote thug image, mm -hmm. which is that hypermasculine image, but he's struggling with his sexuality. He's incredibly vulnerable. He's tender mm -hmm. with the man that he's in love with, essentially. And you mm -hmm. see all that on screen, and suddenly you have to rethink what that image looks like, because mm -hmm. you might see it walking down the street, and, it mean, and you think it means something, mm -hmm. but you watch this story and you see what's going on inside. And I think anytime we can open ourselves to a movie like Moonlight, then we can expand uh, mm -hmm. our view of what's, what's possible behind that, that mm -hmm. image. You mentioned religion as where some of these ideas come from. Where else does it come from as far as what you expect uh, a black man to be? Music. <laughs> Music, um, <laughs> sports, culture. Yeah. There's a, there's a uh, hypermasculinity is um, highly valued in our culture. Um, and we live in a straight man's world. So I think we are trying our best to sort of adhere to those norms and those roles, but they're very limited and very one-sided. Um, and, you know, I was, uh, thinking about the word masculinity and in, in, in uh, uh, gay culture and the dating apps and the dating realms, there's this, this, this trend for a mask for mask. So it's guys looking for a masculine match as a sexual partner or as a romantic partner um, to sort of adhere to these, these, these stereotypes. Mm -hmm. And it really is a form of, of drag. And RuPaul says that, uh, you know, we're all born naked, but the rest of it is drag. It's like a Halloween costume. You can actually go to a store and pick up baggy jeans and a fitted baseball cap and a gold chain or the grill that um, <laughs> Trevante Rhodes wears. And it, it is just that. It's a mask. And underneath it, there's this person who's trapped and imprisoned, mm -hmm. unable to uh, express himself, um, unable to be, to be um, um, 
honest with who he is and, mm. and, and authentic. And I think that's, real, that's the real issue here is that there, we're, we're sort of not allowing um, our, our sons and our boys to express themselves and to be soft and tender and to have feelings and to, you know, be caring, which are sort of feminized by our culture mm. and, and considered um, unworthy. Uh, mm. And that's the problem. And, you know, there's this bottled, bottled up rage and, and anger that we see and depression that we see these, these kids lashing out because they don't have these outlets because they're not allowed to. This is heartbreaking. Yeah, it's really, you know, it needs to be discussed. And I'm glad that these films are having mm -hmm. uh, a wide theatrical release because people are talking about it. Because if, if it didn't, we wouldn't know it exists. Mm -hmm. um, but it is very limiting. And, it, and it, there's, a, there's a loss. We're losing our sons and our boys because we're not able to see their full potential and who they really are. Do you want to jump in? No, I just want to say it's not all that bad in terms of for everyone. Mm -hmm. Because when we also, we also have to understand class as a very important role mm -hmm. in how black masculinity is celebrated and has a space and a place to be what you want to be. Those very questions you're raising in terms of showing emotions, showing tenderness, mm -hmm. feelings. So I think it's important to also look at black masculinities in terms of understanding class and loca location. Because mm -hmm. working class black masculinity doesn't have access to the same resources as middle class black masculinity. And the ability to express themselves in narratives that speaks to feelings, that speak to the truth, that can celebrate uh, what it means to failure, to be mm -hmm. failure. And you can celebrate that. But within the working class black masculinity, failure is never celebrated. Mm -hmm. It's only toughness and success. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to also see the other side in which there are aspects of our communities in which black masculinities is not under that same tr that stress, mm -hmm. and it is celebrated, and it is rewarded for, for who it is. Mm -hmm. And I, to equally speak to that, I think, is to put a balance to, to the picture. Just to add to that, though, like when you're working class versus upper middle class, you're working to create an opportunity, right? Mm -hmm. For your family, for yourself, or whatever, and the performance of a hyper-masculinity is connected to this idea that you'll be Production. rewarded in general society for looking like you uh, know what's going on, looking like you're in charge, looking like you can be a supervisor or a manager mm -hmm. or a boss, right? Um, so class really does matter, right? When you get to a, a, a higher uh, socioeconomic class, parents, families, supports, opportunities are made through those circles. Mm -hmm. So if you do fail, an uncle can create another opportunity exactly. for you. Right? If you don't make a lot of money, you can inherit something from, exactly. from them. So there's opportunities can be created the higher you go up in the socioeconomic chain. Mm -hmm. So when you get to uh, like working class black male, black masculinity, you're going to see a hyper-masculine in performance because the rest of society says you could be rewarded if you perform in this particular kind of way. Yes. Well, and if you connect that to culture, working class black men produce most of what becomes popular culture. <laughs> popular culture. culture. Yep. Also, uh, working class black women. So yes. if you look at where you know the blues comes from, you look mm -hmm. at where uh, hip hop mm -hmm. comes from. Mm -hmm. You know, this is this is actually uh, there's a connection I think yep. between uh, maybe the intensity of that performance or sometimes the pressure it's under uh, for both class and race reasons and the culture that's produced as a result that then we all take on as our own popular culture. Well, my and, husband um, is biracial and he says he's never been more aware of his skin color than he has. Mm -hmm. in Canada. Mm -hmm. He's lived in India, East Africa, and he's from the UK. Um, I'm wondering, can you identify with that? Has, is that has, growing up, was that something that was made aware? Well, I'd like to point out to my Canadian friends that the only place I've ever been called a nigger, pardon my use of the N-word, um, was in Canada. I was in Calgary studying, doing my MBA, and I was shocked because I grew up in a tourist town, Montego Bay, where, you know, primarily black, but we have a lot of white tourists, and it never was a factor. Here, it matters, and I am now married to a white man, and people presume that just because I'm married, or they've said, you know, well, you don't understand the black experience because you're married to a, a white man. I was like, well, when I walk down the road... You're still black. <laughs> still black. You know, I don't have him, you know, attached surgically to my hip. Mm -hmm. um, so it is a, um, a unique experience for me to be in this space. I won't say it's outrightly hostile, mm -hmm. but I do know that how I dress, where I wear, when I wear a certain type of um, attire, my re my, the response I get, the reactions I get are certainly different. Mm -hmm. And so I have to, because it wouldn't happen to me in Jamaica, I wouldn't even think twice about it. Mm -hmm. But here, where I am definitely the minority, I have to be conscious of that. That's my experience. Mm -hmm. Jonathan? Uh, you know, I, 
in the acting realm uh, and casting, and uh, I remember doing this workshop once, um, and our acting coach was saying, you know, uh, Jonathan, as a as an African Canadian male, like in regards to American casting and TV and film, you have to sort of know the different types that you're playing, and be able to convince the casting directors about uh, the roles that you're up for. Because we live in Canada and we live in Toronto, it's a bubble, and, and we're almost colorblind to the different types of people that we see every day. We're so diverse; it's such a melting pot. Um, but then, if you go to the states, it's very segregated, and they do adhere to these stereotypes and these mm -hmm. roles. And, we, and I, for the moment, I was just kind of like, "Oh, like I thought my skin color was enough to be that I'm black." But, <laughs> but he, he's like, you know, so you have to really, you know, study these different types of of, um, of blackness, of blackness, mm -hmm. of caricatures that that, that exist. Because it's very different in the states than it is in here in Canada. We are um, blessed to kind of see everyone as equals and 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 you know have that. But parts of Canada. Parts of Canada. <laughs> parts of Canada. I'll even say the bubble. I'll even say the bubble. I'll even say the bubble. No, no, no. I'll just say Toronto. Where you live? I'm from there again. I don't know where you live. You want to live where you live? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me retract that. Cameron, how about you? Um. Racism is a problem in Canada, quite obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, it affects not just black people, it certainly affects indigenous people in a major, major way. It affects uh, Muslims and many other people in major ways. Yeah. The biggest racism problem for me in Canada is denial. Mm -hmm. It's that it doesn't exist. Yeah. It's that we don't have it here. We're not as bad as they are uh, south of the border. And uh, that's clearly not true. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you look at outcomes on so many different levels in terms of education, employment, promotion, you know, wealth in Canada. There are racial differences. So that's, that doesn't happen by accident. Um, I wanted um, to read something from a film critic uh, by the name of Rad Simon Pillay, speaking about arguing about former Mayor Rob Ford's re-election campaign with a group of black men in a local barbershop. He writes, Finally, one barber uh, dropped the gauntlet, didn't care if Ford smoked crack or said stupid things or ran a poor political game. He was a good role model for their kids because he didn't try to make friends with the LGBTQ community. Rad writes, I grew up homophobic too, a product of my environment or just plain ignorance. And I knew that was the end to the argument. I don't know whether homophobia is more prevalent in black communities than white. I just know that it's far more obvious whether in hip hop, dance hall, or a barbershop. Anyone in that room of 20 could have been a homosexual, nodding along to an attitude that keeps the closet door slammed shut. Is he right? Is uh, that homophobia, homophobia is on average louder in black communities? No, it's not. <coughs> um, homophobia takes on different forms in different communities. And what often does not happen is we don't speak about a qualitative and quantitative differences in terms of how people navigate and experience that. Um, if we look at the black community, there's always been a group of women in Toronto that I can speak to, heterosexual women, who have always accepted black gay men. Mm -hmm. And there have always been black organizations in Toronto. I used to belong to the, uh, a few of them in which, uh, as an out gay man, I was always accepted. So I think, again, it has to do with class and how you navigate that world and who you socialize with. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe, yes, I think we, we often demonize the community because of rap and uh, religion. Mm -hmm. and, and if we take rap and religion as the two only measuring uh, tools of how we evaluate homophobia in the community, well, certainly every music is homophobic, not just black music, all right? So I think uh, we need to be cautious of, of creating this degree that the black community is more homophobic than the white community. I think we, we need to understand that within the context of the black community, we may lack resources mm -hmm. to create queer spaces, mm -hmm. and therefore the organization's struggle tends to be around race more so than around any other factor because racism has this ugly face of hitting us at, as, as faces at the bottom of the well. But we need to understand that equally within that struggle of race that many of us are struggling with to, to come to terms with creating a safe space for black folks. And we are not more homophobic than the white community in any way. So I have never done a study, and I like studies as a lawyer. I like evidence. <laughs> <laughs> so I can't speak to the empirical evidence. I'll leave that to the academics. But I will say that one of the challenges I am finding is there is not enough help being given to the community to unpack homophobia. Mm -hmm. um, I think that in dealing with the Jamaican community that I can speak about um, with some degree of knowledge, I can't say expertly here in Canada, um, there hasn't been an, a deliberate attempt to reach out to this community to help them to negotiate what it means to be gay 
or black <laughs> or both in, in, in Canadian space. And so people are left with this, you know, this, 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 this well, lack of knowledge. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Terms are pejorative. You are a lawyer. <laughs> the lack of knowledge <laughs> <laughs> that comes from hearing this every day from the, you know, the evangelicals. Who this is a very this is a money maker for these mm-hmm. um, for many of these evangelicals. Certainly in Jamaica, it's a money maker to preach. Do you think to, because you do work in Jamaica, do you find that and Jamaica has anti-gay laws there? Yeah. Do you think that some of those views are being imported? Exactly. To which is which is what we've found when um, Jamaicans migrate, mm-hmm. like any minority. They congregate for safety mm-hmm. and they reinforce the, 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 the messages. And so we're not helping them to unpack. So one of the things my organization, the Canadian HIV AIDS Legal Network, is trying to do is to make um, you know, connections with diaspora groups. We are we met with the Jamaican Canadian Association, for example. We're trying to meet with, we brought someone up from Trinidad, from you know, Grenada, etc. We're trying to get them to come and tell their stories here to their people here about what's really happening on the ground. Because the reality is they just hear what the narrative is that their pastors are telling them, and mm-hmm. we're not helping them to unpack this. We, the, people are a function of what they have been taught, mm-hmm. and we, we have to help them to unlearn this. It's a great point, and I think one other thing that's worth mentioning is that both the churches and the laws, certainly in the English-speaking Caribbean and uh, Anglophone Africa as well, aren't, they come from Europe, yeah. right? Exactly. Yeah. This is a product of colonialism. Mm-hmm. The, these laws, whether it's in India, uh, in East Africa. Mm-hmm. Uh, or even in, the States too. Yeah, yeah. 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 The, these, these were introduced not by uh, people of African descent, yeah. but by people of European descent. And we also need to look at the political system. Who controls the political system around homophobic laws? It's, I certainly don't see a, a House of Commons or a, a Queen's Park filled with black politicians saying no to gay rights. Mm-hmm. And so I think we also need to look at the, the political power structure that, that fuels this homophobia and feeds it, but at the same time has, a, has an escape through the media to demonize the black community as always lacking, wanting, and not civilized. We are not always lacking, wanting, and civilized. We are civilized. I think it's just that we don't have the same mediums to educate the public about who we are and what we are doing. There's many great examples of good work happening in the black community around queer issues. Mm -hmm. Mark, do you want to jump in? Um, Coming back to these points, I I do think the the question that we need to answer or even think about is, is is there a sense of black masculinity that doesn't come out of white patriarchy? Like, Mm -hmm. do we we need another starting point that's not colonialism or, or or has residues of colonial ide- ideology where we can start thinking about black masculinities in, their, in all of their ranges, in all of their forms. Um, and that's really hard to do because, because of the church, because of the education system, because of the state, um, and the ways in which our bodies have always been under the control of, of government and, and colonial uh, empires, really. So, yeah. I mean, that, I think that's the, the next struggle really is like we're at an intersectional moment for for blackness in and of itself and and black masculinities need to get to a point where we we can believe that there are origins of or or ways in which black masculinity can exist that doesn't rely on you know the breadwinner model Mm -hmm. the man works outside of the whole home bring home the bacon model that is 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 the cookie cutter model that that we've been forced to perform in order to survive in in a society in which we were brought to. Mm -hmm. We only have a few minutes left. Jonathan, your final one? Off of Mark's uh, last comment about survival, I feel like with hypermasculinity within the black community, um, it is almost tribal. It is almost like a survival instinct to perform um, this, uh, to get ahead, to survive, to navigate this world um, unscathed. Um, and, I, and, I, and I wondered where that came from, what the origin of that is. And I, and I wonder if it's linked to slavery. I wonder if all those years of being emasculated and oppressed by white people and white men, um, that need to sort of overcompensate, to be stronger than, um, to sort of retaliate. Um, and, and I feel like, you're, you know, that, that phrase, you're only as strong as your weakest link. And so like, as a tribe of the black community, to have someone um, appear effeminate or be homosexual, it's almost like a threat to the community. And, and so immediately we disown you or, or we uh, discard you because we, we can't keep you with us if we're gonna be strong. Mm-hmm. You, you pose a threat to our, to our tribe. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I think there's a bit of fear there. Um, it's threatening. It challenges the idea that we have of, of, who, of who we think we are um, and who we ought to be to survive. Um, but it is about um, creating a dialogue and a discussion to um, unpack and, and unlearn those those uh, stigmas. 
I want to bring mm. it back to the movies because mm. we started talking about the movies. And Cameron, um, I wanted to give you the final question. Mm. What needs to change to open people up to more of a range for black men when it comes to Hollywood and the stories that are told about black people? I think the first thing is we need to see more of these stories. Um, and we need to stop being surprised when mm. they're successful. Uh, every time <laughs> there's a black movie that does well at the box office, you see reports in the media saying Hidden Figures is overperformed or Ride Along is overperformed. Uh, they're just performing, right? There's, there, there's a hunger, there's an appetite for these movies, so let's make more of them, let's watch more of them, and let's give opportunities for independent filmmakers as well, like Barry Jenkins, and there are many others, Steve McQueen, uh, Dee Rees, who just had a new movie at the Sundance Film Festival. Remember, a lot of this is not just about black men, this is about yeah. women as well, um, so who, are, who are telling some of, I think, the most powerful stories uh, about life in the African diaspora right now. Uh, let's give them more space to, to tell their stories and let's go out and watch them. And speaking of hidden figures, it's the top earner, right, That's for right. the year, mm -hmm. as far as Oscar pictures goes. Mm -hmm. Cameron, thank you so much for being here. My pleasure. Mark, Jonathan. Thank you. Maurice. Thank you. And Leslie. My pleasure. Thank you all for being here. And Maurice, I'm sorry you hurt your ankle on the way here. <laughs> <laughs> it's really nice to have you here. Jamaicans don't belong here. Is <laughs> <laughs> I see uh, sidewalks and Jamaicans don't, don't get along. <laughs> well, thank you all. Thank Appreciate you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.